Greetings and welcome in to the Patuxent General, your place for food, drink, local info, and local ghost stories in our continuing series, The House on the Corner. I am your host, Jess. This week, we are overflowing with information. Our drinks are birch beer and root beer. Our recipe today is stuffed potato soup. Our place is the Dexter Training Grounds in Cranston Street Armory. Men trained on these grounds during the Civil War as well as World War I. Whoa, I can't wait to get back there. Then, our continuing reading of the case of Charles Dexter Ward. But first, we would like to thank our Patreon subscribers. You fabulous people make it possible for us to exist. And we are growing every day, so thank you. All right, that's the biz. Let's get to it. Five and twenty ducks at the end of my street. Skitter across the ice. Steam from my coffee fogs up my glasses. Winter in Patuxet. Stuffed potato soup. For me, this is the second most comforting soup. Just warmth in a bowl. My pal and ex-boss Jeff and I made this together one snowy, cold Patuxet day. It fills the house with the best smells. Caramelized onions, bacon. <laughs> bacon. <sighs> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, so the soup. I hope you'll love it. Bacon potato chive. Also known as stuffed potato soup. It serves four or two hungry. You will need... Four slices uncured slab bacon, chopped small. Six large golden or other creamy potato, cubed and one half inch squares. One large onion chopped fine. Four garlic cloves chopped fine. Two quarts water or your favorite stock, enough to cover the potatoes. Three quarters of a cup cream, salt and pepper to taste, and one bunch chopped chives. In a good sized pot, brown the chopped bacon. Then remove and put it aside. Saute the onions in that pan until translucent. Add the garlic and saute for two more minutes. At this point, add the potatoes and cover with water or stock, uh, salt and pepper. Bring to a gentle boil until the potatoes are soft. Take your masher or a clean bottom of a wine bottle and mash once or twice right in the pot. All right, now the magic. At this point, if you wanted to add anything you like on a baked potato, now is the time. I'm talking ham, cheese, cooked broccoli, butter, chili, sour cream. But I'm going to use chopped chives. Remove from the heat and serve. If you do have leftovers, reheat them gently on low heat. It will warm you from the inside out. Enjoy. I know this sounds simple, but buckle up, we have a rabbit hole of root drinks to fall down. And you're riding in a handbasket. Methyl salicylate. That's right, you heard me. Methyl salicylate. This, constant listener, is the chemical compound that enables us to see blue sparks when crushing or chewing wintergreen mints. This compound is found a few places in nature. One is the wintergreen plant. Another is the black birch tree. This tree, along with other sweet birch or yellow birch, are used in making birch beer. And this is why birch beer tastes like wintergreen. It seems like the most traditional birch beer company to beat is the Pennsylvania Dutch. Their basic recipe has been expanded to include blue, red, and white birch beer, which is actually clear. Now, originally, there were differences of color due to a variety of birch species, but now they use artificial coloring. So, first, the most intriguing cocktail I came across in my research. A Dirty Dutchman. By the way, none of the other Dirty Dutchman drinks online had this combination. But here it is. Two ounces Jägermeister. A squeeze of lemon over ice, then filled with birch beer. Woof, that is dirty. The earliest recipe that I had was first published in 1902 in Miss Seeley's cookbook, and she has this to say about root beer. 
Root beer, this wholesome drink, which was made every spring in the households of our American forebears, is delicious as well as healthful. It is a pity that the use of genuine root beer is dying out. The sarsaparilla, yellow dock, dandelion, burdock, and hops used for making were all products of the nearby woods and fields. Bark of the wild cherry was sometimes put in, birch bark also, and elecampane, and the aromatic spinocard. In springtime, children went out with trowel and basket, and their intimate knowledge of the growths about them helped their brewing. The roots would all be thoroughly washed and then bruised. To two gallons of water, take an ounce of each of the ingredients. Put the roots in cold water and set them over the fire so that the heating will draw all the essences and flavors out of the growths. Let them steep for about half an hour and then strain. Add a pound of sugar and about 25 drops of the oil of sassafras or spruce. And when the brew is cold enough not to kill the yeast, add say six or eight tablespoons to the above quantity of water or a dry yeast cake or two dissolved in a little tepid water. Stir the yeast in well and set the brew away in an earthen jar and give it some hours to work. After three or four hours, it may be bottled or kept in the jar for immediate drinking without bottling. Miss Seeley was very thorough. However, my knowledge of the spring roots cannot compare to that of those children, so here is a 60 years younger version from the Unique Family Favorites Cookbook by Esther Sue Fisher. For quick root beer, you will need two cups of sugar, four teaspoons root beer extract, one half teaspoon yeast, one gallon glass jar, half filled with warm, non-chlorinated H2O, Add the sugar, the extract, and the yeast to the water in the jar. Mix until dissolved. Fill the jar the rest of the way with warm water and tighten the lid. Set in the sun for about four hours and then refrigerate until cold. And that is it. It is ready to go. How about a root beer old-fashioned? Since you have the root beer extract, dig this. You will need, for your root beer syrup, one cup of sugar, one cup of water, and a dash or just a, just a couple drops of root beer extract. Simmer until dissolved and then let that cool. You will need two ounces of black bourbon, bitters, and an orange peel. In a ridiculously cold rocks glass, put ice, bourbon, bitters, and one half an ounce of your root beer syrup. Stir well and top with a squeezed orange peel. So, there you have it. Roots drinks for all. Enjoy. The Dexter Training Ground and Cranston Street Armory. Well, I thought that this week we might take a little trip to Providence. The address is 310 Cranston Street, Providence, Rhode Island, 02907. It was constructed in 1907 and occupied by the Rhode Island National Guard until 1996. It was listed as one of America's 11 most endangered historic places in 1997. The park was donated by Ebenezer Dexter in 1824, of whom there is a bronze statue, which was erected in 1874. More information and history of this place is available at ppsri.org or Wikipedia. My interest today is the correlation to H.P. Lovecraft. I find it intriguing. In Lovecraft's Providence and adjacent parts, Henry L.P. Buckworth Jr. says, on Cranston Street, between Dexter and Parade Streets, part of the Dexter donation of 1824, the other portion being to the Dexter Asylum on the east side, the stipulation of the testator that no public executions be held on this site has been faithfully complied with. So, seeing as the case of Charles Dexter Ward was written in 1927, we can all see the correlation to the asylum and how the character developed a little bit in Lovecraft's mind. Interesting. All right, are you ready? Let's settle in for the next episode of The Case of Charles Dexter Ward.
I want to tell you about my friend Mike and his electromagnetic pinball museum and restoration arcade. It's an all-inclusive place to relax and share anything related to modern pinball and pinball and arcade games. A group of pinball and arcade fans with an addiction to games of all kinds and Lego too. $10 gets you free play on pinball and arcade games all day. You can find them at 881 Main Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, or online at www.electromagneticpinballmuseum.com. Joseph Kerwin, as revealed by the rambling legends embodied in what Ward heard and unearthed, was a very astonishing, enigmatic, and obscurely horrible individual. He had fled from Salem to Providence, universal haven of the odd, the free, and the dissenting, at the beginning of the great witchcraft panic. Being in fear of accusation because of his solitary ways in queer chemical or alchemical experiments, he was a colorless-looking man of about 30, and was soon found qualified to become a freeman of Providence. Thereafter, buying a home lot just north of Gregory Dexter's at about the foot of Olney Street. His house was built on Stamper's Hill, west of Town Street, in what later became Olney Court. And in 1761, he replaced this with a larger one on the same site, which is still standing. Now, the first odd thing about Joseph Kerwin was that he did not seem to grow much older than he had been on his arrival. He engaged in shipping enterprises, purchased wharfage near Mile End Cove, helped rebuild the Great Bridge of 1713, and in 1723 was one of the founders of the Congregational Church on the Hill. But always did he retain his nondescript aspect of a man not greatly over 30 or 35. As decades mounted up, this singular quality began began to excite wide notice. But Kerwin always explained it by saying he came of hardy forebearers and practiced a simplicity of living which did not wear him out. How much simplicity could be reconciled with the inexplicable comings and goings of the secretive merchant and with the gleamings of his windows at all hours of night was not very clear to the townsfolk. And though they were prone to assign other reasons for his continued youth and longevity, it was held, for the most part, that Kerwin's incessant mixings and boilings of chemicals had much to do with his condition. Gossip spoke of the strange substances he brought in from London and the Indies on his ships or purchased in Newport, Boston, and New York. And when old Dr. Jebez Bowen came from Rehoboth and opened his apothecary shop across the Great Bridge at the sign of the unicorn and mortar, there was ceaseless talk of the drugs, acids, and metals that the taciturn recluse incessantly bought or ordered from him, acting on the assumption that Kerwin possessed a wondrous and secret medical skill many sufferers of various sorts applied to him for aid. But though he appeared to encourage their belief in a non-committal way, and always gave gave them odd-colored potions in response to their requests, it was observed that his ministrations to others seldom proved of benefit. At length, when over fifty years had passed over the stranger's advent, and without producing more than five years' apparent change in his face and physique, the people began to whisper more darkly, and began to meet more than halfway that desire for isolation which he had always shown. Private letters and diaries of the period reveal, too, a multitude of other reasons why Joseph Kerwin was marveled at, feared, and finally shunned like a plague. His passion for graveyards, in which he was glimpsed at all hours, under all conditions, was notorious. Though no one had witnessed any deed on his part which could actually be turned ghoulish. On the Patuxet Road, he had a farm at which he generally lived during the summer, and to which he would frequently be seen riding at various odd times during the day or night. Here, his only visible servants, farmers, and caretakers were a sullen pair of aged Narragansetts, the husband, dumb and curiously scarred, and the wife of a very repulsive cast of continents. In the lead to of this house was the laboratory where most of the chemical experiments were conducted. Curious porters and teamers who delivered bottles, bags, or boxes at the small reed door would exchange amounts of the fantastic flasks, crucibles, lembics, and furnaces they saw in the low shelved room, and prophesied in whispers that the close-mouthed 
Shimist, by which they meant alchemist, would not be long in finding the philosopher's stone. The nearest neighbors to this farm, the Fenners, a quarter of a mile away, had still queerer things to tell of certain sounds which they insisted came from the Corwin place in the night. They were cries, they said, that sustained howlings, and they did not like the large numbers of livestock which thronged in the pastures, for no such amount was needed to keep a lone man and a very few servants in meat, milk, and wool. And the identity of the stock seemed to change from week to week as new droves were purchased from the Kingston farmers. Then, too, there was something very obnoxious about the certain great stone outbuilding with high, narrow slits for windows. Great bridge builders, likewise, had much to say of Kerwin's townhouse and only court. Not so much of the new fine one built in 1761, when the man must have been nearly a century old, but the first low gambled roof one with a windowless attic and shingled sides, whose timbers he took the peculiar precaution of burning after its demolition. Here there was much less mystery, it is true, but the hours at which lights were seen and the secretiveness of the two swarthy foreigners who comprised the only men servants, the hideous indistinct mumblings of the incredibly aged French housekeeper, the large amounts of food seemed to enter a door through which only four persons lived, and the quality of certain voices often heard in muffled conversation at highly unseasonable times, all combined with what was known of the Patuxet Farm to give the place a bad name. In choicer circles, too, the Kerwin home was by no means undiscussed, for as the newcomer had gradually worked into the church and trading life of the town, he had naturally made acquaintances of the better sort, whose company and conversation he was well fitted by education to enjoy. His birth was known to be good, since the Kerwins or Corwins of Salem needed no introduction in New England. It developed that Joseph Kerwin had traveled much in his early life, living for a good time in England and making at least two voyages to the Orient. And his speech, when he designed to use it, was that of a learned and cultivated Englishman. But for some reason or other, Kerwin did not care for society. While never actually rebuffing a visitor, he always reared such a wall of reserve that few could think of anything to say to him which would not sound inane. There seemed to lurk in his bearing some cryptic, sardonic arrogance, as if he had come to find all human beings dull, though having moved among stranger and more potent entities. When Dr. Checkley, the famous wit, came from Boston in 1738 to be rector of King's Church, he did not neglect calling on one of whom he soon heard so much, but left in a very short while because of some sinister undercurrent he detected in his host's discourse. Charles Ward told his father when they discussed Kerwin one winter evening that he would have given much to learn what the mysterious old man had said to that sprightly cleric, but that all diarists agree concerning Dr. Checkerley's reluctance to repeat anything he had heard. The good man had been hideously shocked and could never recall Joseph Kerwin without a visible loss of the gay urbanity for which he was famed. More definite, however, was the reason why another man of taste and breeding avoided the haughty hermit. In 1746, Mr. John Merritt, an elderly English gentleman of literary and scientific learnings, came from Newport to the town which was so rapidly overtaking it in standing and built a fine country seat on the neck, which is now the heart of the best residence section. He lived in considerable style and comfort, keeping the first coach and liveried servants in town, and taking great pride in his telescope, his microscope, and his well-chosen library of English and Latin books. Hearing of Kerwin as the owner of the best library in Providence, Mr. Merritt early paid him a call and was more cordially received than most other callers at the house had been. His admiration for his host's ample shelves, which besides the Greek, Latin, and English classics, were equipped with a remarkable battery of physiological, mathematical, and scientific works, 
including Paracelsus Agricola, Van Helmet, Silvius, Glauber, Boyle, Boerhave, Betcher and Stahl, led Kerwin to suggest a visit to the farmhouse and laboratory, whether he had never invited anyone before. And the two drove out at once in Mr. Merritt's coach. Mr. Merritt always confessed to seeing nothing really horrible at the farmhouse, but maintained that the titles of the books in the special library on the thermological, alchemical, and theological subjects which Kerwin kept in the front room were alone sufficient to inspire him with a lasting loathing. Perhaps, however, the facial expression of the owner in exhibiting them contributed much to the prejudice. This bizarre collection, besides a host of standard works which Mr. Merritt was not too alarmed to envy, embraced nearly all the Kabbalists, demonologists, and magicians known to man, and was a treasure trove of lore in the doubtful realms of alchemy and astrology. Hermes Trimagistus in Mesnard's edition, the Turba Phyllis Forum, and Gerber's Liber Investigationis. Artifius key of wisdom all were there, with the Kabbalistic Zohar, Peter Jimmy's set of Albertus Magnus, Raymond Lully's Ars Magneta et Ultima in Zessner's edition, Roger Bacon's Thesaurus Chemicus, Flood's Clavis Alchemi, Clavis Alchemini, and Trithemius's De Lapitade philosophico crowding them close. Medieval Jews and Arabs were represented in profusion, and Mr. Merritt turned pale upon when taking down a fine volume conspicuously labeled as the Quinan e Islam, and found it was in truth the forbidden Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul al read, of which he had heard such monstrous things whispered some years previously as the exposure of nameless rites at the strange little fishing village of Kingsport in the province of Massachusetts Bay. But oddly enough, the worthy gentleman owned himself most impalpably disquieted by one mere minor detail. On the huge mahogany table, there lay, face downwards, a badly worn copy of Borellus bearing many cryptical marginalia and interlineations in Kerwin's own hand. The book was open to about the middle, and one paragraph displayed such thick and tremendous pen strokes beneath the lines of the mystic black letter that the visitor could not resist scanning it through. Whether it was the nature of the passage underscored, or the feverish heaviness of the strokes which formed the underscoring, he could not tell, but something in that combination affected him very peculiarly. He recalled it to the end of his days, writing it down from memory in his diary, and once trying to recite it to his close friend, Dr. Checkerley, till he saw how greatly it disturbed him and the urbane rector. It read, The essential salts of animals may be so prepared and preserved that the ingenious man may have the whole Ark of Noah in his own study and raise the fine shape of an animal out of the ashes at his pleasure. And by that like method, from the essential salts of human dust, a philosopher may, without any criminal necromancy, call up the shape of any dead ancestor from the dust where unto his Brody has been incinerated. It was near the docks along the southerly part of Town Street, however, that the worst things were muttered about Joseph Kerwin. Sailors are superstitious folk, and the seas and salts who manned the infinite rum slave and molasses sloops, the rakish privateers, and the great brigs of the Browns, Crawfords, and Tillinghasts all made strange furtive signs of protection when they saw the slim, deceptively young-looking figure with his yellow hair and slight stoop entering the Kerwin warehouse in Dubloon Street, or talking with captains and supercargoes on the long quay where the Kerwin ships rode restlessly. Kerwin's own clerks and captains hated and feared him, and all his sailors were from Martinique, St. Eustace, Havana, or Port Royal. 
It was, in a way, the frequency with which these sailors were replaced, which inspired the acutest and most tangible part of the fear in which the old man was held. A crew would be turned loose in the town on shore leave, some of its members perhaps charged with this errand or that, and when resembled, it would almost sure to lack one or more men. And many of the errands had concerned that farm of Patuxet Road, and that few of the sailors had ever been seen to return from that place was not forgotten. So that in time, it became exceedingly difficult for Kerwin to keep his oddly assorted hands. Almost invariably, several would desert after hearing the gossip of the Providence Wharfs, and their replacement in the West Indies became an increasingly great problem to the merchant. By 1760, Joseph Kerwin was virtually an outcast. Suspected of vague horrors and demonic alliances, which seemed all the more menacing because they could not be named, understood, or even proven to exist. The last straw may have come from the affair of the missing soldiers of 1758. For in March and April of that year, two royal regiments on their way to New France were quartered in Providence and depleted by an inexplicable process far beyond the average rate of desertion. Rumor dwelt on the frequency with which Kerwin was wont to seem talking with the red-coated strangers. And as several of them began to be missed, people thought of the odd conditions among his own seamen. What would have happened if the regiments had not been ordered on? No one can tell. Meanwhile, the merchant's worldly affairs were prospering. He had a virtual monopoly of the town's trade in saltpeter, black pepper, and cinnamon, and easily led any other shipping establishment save the Browns in his importation of brassware, indigo, cotton, woolen, salt, rigging, iron, paper, and English goods of every kind. Such shopkeepers as James Green at the sign of the Elephant in Cheapside, the Russells at the sign of the Golden Eagle across the bridge, or Clark and Nightingale at the Frying Pan and Fish near New Coffee House, depended almost wholly upon him for their stock, and his arrangements with the local distillers, the Narragansett dairymen and the horse breeders, and the Newport candle makers made him one of the prime exporters of the colony. Ostracized though he was, he did not lack for civil spirit of a sort. When the colony house burnt down. He subscribed handsomely to the lotteries which built the new brick one. Still standing at the head of parade and the old Main Street was built in 1761. In that same year, too, he helped rebuild the Great Bridge after the October Gale. He replaced many of the books that the public library consumed in the Colony House fire and bought heavily in the lottery that gave the muddy market parade and deep-rutted town street their pavement of great round stones with a brick footwalker, causey in the middle. About this time also, he built the plain but excellent new house whose doorway is still such a triumph of carving. And when the Whitefield adherents broke off from Dr. Cotton's Hill Church in 1743 and founded Deacon Snow's Church across the bridge, Kerwin had gone with them, though his zeal and attendance soon abated. Now, however, he cultivated piety once more, as if to dispel the shadow which had thrown him into isolation, and would soon begin to wreck the business fortunes. And would soon begin to wreck his business fortunes, if not sharply checked. Thank you again for joining us at the PG. If you would like to reach out with a question, recipe, or local ghost story, we love ghost stories. Our email is jess at patuxetgeneral.com. We would love to hear from you. We might use your info on the air. So let's meet back here next time at the Patuxet General. A Something for Posterity production pre-recorded in Patuxet. <laughs> <laughs>